Hey guys, Gamerzak here, and welcome to another one of my Civilization 6 videos. Now, since uploading Civilization 6 vids to my channel, I've seen a ton of speculation of how the game is actually going to work. Well, recently, media outlets and YouTubers have been allowed to show many hours of gameplay, including an official live stream where the developers talk about the game as they play, linked in the description, of course. Now, besides the big things like unstacked cities, hidden agendas, and the Eureka system, which I do talk about in my 10 biggest changes video, the points in this video are features that haven't really been focused on specifically, but shown or talked about offhand. So you might have missed some of them. And I'd like to point out these 12 details that you might have missed. Of course, the game is still in development, so some of these things might change slightly as time goes on, but I'll try to get through these in a reasonable amount of time. So first up, a lot of people have been asking how builders repair tiles, and we've seen it. Builders repair tiles in one turn, and it does not use a charge. So if you are worried about barbarians or enemies coming in and raiding and pillaging your lands and then you needing to spend builders to fix it all up, well, don't have to worry. It just takes time. It doesn't take a charge out of the builders. And there's really not much else to say about that, so let's move on to point number two. Now here's an interesting one also to do with builders. Resources like iron and stone and those sorts of things can actually be harvested by a builder like chopping down a forest for a short-term boost. The developers were talking about building a district on top of a resource tile and they didn't really want that resource tile so they said they could bring a builder up and harvest that resource out to give a production boost to the nearby city and then put a district on that now empty tile. This is a very interesting change because it's sort of implies that these resources, you're meant to take the ones you want and if you have extra and you don't really want it and you prefer space, because space is definitely, you know, just an empty tile, can be very valuable because of the unstacked cities. Well, empty tiles can actually be as valuable as a resource that you already have two or three of. So there you have it, builders can harvest out a resource and completely remove it off the map. Moving on to point number three, building settlers no longer stops city growth. So in the past, it has been the case where when your city is building a settler, it consumes the food that it's gaining, so your city stops growing. But in Civilization VI, your city's population is actually quite important. And with the unstacked cities, building more cities is more important, so they don't want to discourage you too much from building settlers. So now when you build a settler, your city continues to grow. Because the size of your city determines how many districts that you can have, every three population supports one district. But you don't have to worry too much about people spamming settlers by buying them constantly. Because they did sort of mention that every time you buy a unit or you buy something, the cost of that thing will go up. So the more you buy something, the more expensive it gets to buy it again. So this prevents spamming and they specifically mentioned this in relation to spamming settlers. And on a side note on settlers, we've also seen the settler be captured and then retaken and it did not convert into a builder. And I'm not sure if this is gonna stay in the final release, but that's how it worked in the build that we've seen. And another side note on cities, capturing a city doesn't seem to half its population anymore. So a city changing hands a couple times won't completely ruin it like it does in Civilization V. Which I think a lot of people are gonna appreciate this change. Anyway, moving on to point number four. Promoting a unit insta-heals it by 50 points, but it will end that unit's turn. Now in Civilization V, a lot of military units will get promotions just through fighting and combat and surviving things. And uh, well, you often had the choice of instant healing or giving it a permanent bonus. Well now, whatever bonus you pick, it will also heal the unit by 50 points. Which from the looks of things is actually a significant amount. Now of course you can hold off on promoting the unit and saving that promotion for when it really does need it, but it won't gain any further XP until it promotes up. So that's going to be a choice of how you handle your military units. Now point number five. It's something that I have mentioned before, but it is one of those things that some people still don't know about and it's such a big change. The harbor district can be built on a coast even if your city isn't next to the water, and naval units will spawn from the harbor district. 
so you no longer have to build a city on the coast for it to produce naval units. That's fantastic. I think that's one of the best changes so far, and it plays especially well with the unstacked cities. And also a note about the coast. If you happen to see a rocky cliff instead of a smooth beach, units can't actually embark or disembark on that tile. So you could actually look for some coastline which is very rocky and use that as sort of a defensive coast to make sure your city is a little bit more defended. It's kind of like a mountain on the coast sort of thing, which I think is a really cool addition. And then point number six, continents exist even on a Pangaea map. Now there's, there's been a little confusion about this. I've seen some gameplay where it, it wasn't really sure where whether a Pangaea map would have continents. Well, the developers did explain in their live stream that even on a Pangaea map, there are continents and the game will sort of average it out to two civilizations per quote unquote continent. And it's sort of looking at the world based on tectonic plates as continents rather than what land masses are separated by ocean tiles. Now, this is, uh, well, if you've ever seen that video about what is a continent, well, th there's no perfect definition. But gameplay wise, this makes a lot of sense because a lot of civilization's abilities are based on things that happen on other continents, they have better relations with people on other continents, or they hate people outside of their continent, or like the American civilization has bonuses on their own continent, or the AI has certain agendas based on continents. And on a Pangaea map, all of that would just be thrown out because everyone would be on the same continent. So following more of a tectonic plates sort of continent concept, does make a lot of sense gameplay wise. But it's one of those interesting things which I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. Anyway, point number seven. Something that we did know before, roads are built by trade, but traders seem to move one tile a turn when they're establishing the road. Now, a lot of people have been worried about using traders to build a trade route to a potential victim and then rushing military units down. And we've had a chance to actually see some of this in action now. One important note is roads provide different bonuses based on an era. You actually see them labeled as ancient road or modern road, etc. But if you start trading with another civilization without declaring friendship or having good relations, well, nothing stops them from attacking you either, especially if you're with the AI and you start trading with them, they might ask for friendship, but if you turn them down because you intend to attack them, well, nothing stops them from building up a military force and rushing units down your road to your own city. And of course, you can try start a trade route to establish a road for an attack, but it'll hardly be a surprise as long as they're paying attention because it could take 10 or more turns to get that road set up in the first place. And it has been stated that maps in Civilization VI are going to be 20 to 30% bigger. So there's gonna be a lot more space between your civilizations. And that's a point that people have been wondering with the unstacked cities, we're gonna need more land mass and having bigger maps, especially with the new engine and all of that supporting more stuff basically. Bigger maps is something everyone has been wanting and it seems like we're gonna get it this time. But I highly doubt the effectiveness of rushing someone with a trade road and filing units down that road. Preparing a proper attack seems like a better way. Either way, moving on to point number eight. There are visual lenses that act as overlays to show more specific information on the map. So we do know that the developers on Civilization VI are very focused on information being presented on the map at first glance, but more information is always useful. And in the lower left corner above the mini map, there was a button that allows you to activate certain overlays and they're calling these overlays lenses. So you're seeing the world through a different lens. And the lenses that we've seen are religion, continent, appeal, settler, government, and political. And some specifics that we've seen is like the religion lens would actually show which cities and which territories are dominated by which religions and how much they're influenced by each one. And also the settler lens, which shows the amount of fresh water on the map and where it's viable to settle your city. They did say that you can't settle cities too close together. I think it was three tiles away you have to build a city. Three tiles between cities is the closest they can be. There are certain situations that would require that, but considering how important land is, cramping your cities is not going to be a good idea in Civilization VI. But the settler overlay will show the amount of fresh water on certain tiles and that's going to determine the city's starting housing which will affect how fast it grows. And fresh water is also gotten by aqueducts and housing is provided by other buildings as well which help the city grow. Now the cool thing about these lenses is that the lenses will automatically activate when you select the appropriate unit. So for example when you select a settler the settler lens will activate. When you select a prophet 
or a missionary, the religion lens will activate. And that's just really cool. And what we see now is probably temporary and they're probably tweaking how everything looks, but more information being shown a couple clicks away or even just automatically is always good. Now, point number nine. Changing to a new government is a smooth transition without anarchy. But going back to a government that you've been to before, your people will see it as regressing and going backwards, and that can cause anarchy. So starting at chiefdom, if you go and change to a classical republic, because you want to focus on economics and stuff like that, that's great, but then maybe you want to start getting into a bit more military stuff and you change to an autocracy. And then when the war ends, you want to change back to classical republic? Well, you've been to classical republic once, you went to autocracy once and now going back to a government that you used to be, well that is where anarchy can happen. So as long as you're changing to a new form of government that your civilization has never used before, your people will be fine with it. And that's just a really interesting thing. And we have seen that there are multiple tiers of government with at least nine to choose from and possibly more. But they haven't really gone into detail there. And then, point number 10. Civics are an actual tree. It's like a tech tree, but with culture points being the research, you can change the civics in your government for free. And I do have to say, whenever you discover a new tech or discover a new civic, there is a quote that's gonna be voiced by Sean Bean. In case anyone was wondering who's gonna be narrating all of those quotes. And I have to say, I still love Sean Bean's voice acting on this one. So basically the social policies from civilization are gone, and these civics have been expanded into its very own tree. By the way, the type of government you have determines the type and how many civic slots you get, and the wildcard slot can fit any type of civic. And you can change the civics in your government for free whenever you gain a new civic, or you can pay gold to change it immediately. It's sort of like saying that you're pumping money into a specific thing to get the government to change into a specific way. Uh, no cynicism there. But yeah, mechanically speaking, this is a really nice change to how government works, and it seems much more important and much more flexible as well. But not too flexible. It does still have the, the hard restrictions of whichever form of government you choose. And then point number 11, great people are now different and unique and tied to certain eras. That means two different great scientists, they don't do the same thing. They actually have a name and they have unique abilities tied to that person. This is adding a lot more depth and I imagine this is going to be quite complicated for new players who aren't familiar with which great person does what. But all of it is listed out in the great person window that we have now seen. And this is adding a lot of depth and strategy. So for example, you might not want the classical era great scientist, but you might want the modern era great scientist because their abilities are going to be different. And it also has to be said that great people can be bought with money or faith which means faith is getting even a bigger focus and more importance in Civilization VI. Because we've seen faith not only by certain units and buildings, but also great people now. And it's not just the religious great people, all the great people can be bought with faith. But the usual way of earning great people is gonna be through great people points, and this is from civics. We've seen those purple civic cards adding two great person points per turn. And that's probably how you're gonna get most of your great people. And finally, point number 12, city-states. Now this is a big one. City-states are influenced by envoys now, and the more envoys you have, the better bonus you get. And the bonuses are unique to each city-state. And I hear that there are 24 different city-states available. So the purpose of the city-states are no longer random, they are tied to certain unique bonuses. And if you're the first person to meet a city-state, you get an envoy in there for free. Because Civilization VI really is trying to encourage more exploration. So not sending out an explorer doesn't just mean you're not going to get goody huts. Meeting these city-states first is actually very important as well. And you also get envoys over time and completing quests and stuff like that. And you often can assign the envoys you earn to which city-state you want to influence more and which bonus you want to get. And we've seen that having one envoy gives you a certain bonus, having three envoys gives you another bonus, having six envoys gives you another bonus. And also, if you have the minimum number of envoys required and the most envoys there, compared to any other civilization on the map, well, you can be considered the suzerain which basically means you are the most influential civilization tied to that city-state, and then you get an even bigger bonus. And they can be game-changing bonuses. I mean, I'm showing some on the screen right now. If you just read through them, they can be really, really good. Some being for culture, some being for military. And it's not just that. If you are the suzerain, 
or the most influential civilization on a city-state, you can pay a certain amount of gold and take control of a city-state's military units for a while. And by a while, I mean what we see right now is like 20 turns, which they might change. And after that time is up, the military units will return to their city-state, or when the suzerain changes. And also, when you are the suzerain, you get vision of their city. So city-states are massively different, honestly saying, and they seem so important now. They're not just to open up a couple of trade routes or things like that. They, they seem game-changing in ways we've never seen before. From the bonuses to getting the military units to having, of course, the trade routes and the vision and all of that. That means someone playing a political or culture game who suddenly gets attacked by a militaristic civilization could just pay a couple city-states and gain their military units for the next 20 turns to fight off whatever invasion is coming. That can be incredibly powerful. Or someone with that much influence could actually just get an army out of nothing immediately by paying a bunch of city-states. It seems really powerful, but I'm really excited for that one. Alright, and there you have it. Those are 12 new gameplay details that you might not know about. We've only recently seen many of these in the gameplay videos that have recently gone up, and all that gameplay was based on an older build of the game. Which means things have already changed, and more things will continue to change as we get closer to release. But I think it's mainly tweaks and balancing from here on out. And of course, bug fixes, which many people have apparently experienced. It is a Civ game after all. But what do you guys think? I know a lot of you have been debating and contemplating and speculating about the details of the game, and here's 12 what I find at least interesting points that we can talk about. And of course, there are many more changes out there, but I can't be listing every single little detail. I will be going on forever. So let me know down in the comments below, what do you think of these changes? And are there other changes that you're excited or concerned about? How do you think all these changes are going to change the game of Civilization? Alright, so that's it from me. If you'd like to see more Civilization VI content, do subscribe to the channel. I'm releasing one pretty much every Friday now. And I do have one coming up next week, where I'm talking all about that Aztec pre-order thing. Which from what I understand, most people aren't too happy about. And of course, besides that, you can check out my 10 biggest changes of Civilization VI, where we talk about the bigger, more fundamental things of how Civilization VI is changing. Alright, so that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful, and I'll see you in the next video.